Nice to see everybody here. I can't quite believe that we've managed to make it here today. And people that have flown in, people that are here, even myself last night, the first time I've flown in 18 months, and I was equal parts anxious and excited. But again, just a massive shout out to the team here that have managed to go above and beyond and push forward and put on an event like this against all odds, that resilience that they've brought into this to make it a reality. So today I'm going to be talking about resilience. I'm going to be talking about building a new practice in a pandemic at RGA and all of the life learnings that have gone into that to make it a reality. And I talked about resilience. And I imagine resilience is something that you can all relate to because of what we've been through. But often people think resilience is an individual sport. You know, keep calm and carry on. But it's not. It's so much more than that. And people often think, well, I need to sit here in silence and push forward and go harder and harder and harder. Well, yes, go harder, but make sure you have a support network around you. People that make you laugh, people that make you smile, people that make you think about the future. But really, always remembering with resilience, it's not about an individual, it's about a collective. And I think it's often said that you bounce back from resilience. But I don't think that's true. I think it's about moving forward through resilience. The shit that inevitably is going to happen to all of us. How do you take that, channel it, learn from it, and push yourself forward? So you're not just bouncing back, you're moving forward. And I think that's really important. And especially when we start to think about the last 18 months that we've just had. In my lifetime, it's the biggest, craziest thing that's ever happened. But I think it's really important that nothing that happens is predetermined or fixed, i.e., you're in control of how you react to that. You're in control of, do you shift gears? Do you change industries? Do you go, and go even faster and harder in the things you love? But always remembering that the way you respond is up to you. And we look at how the world has responded, standing up for humanity, our doctors and nurses, against everything, pushing themselves forward standing up for justice, not just in America, but in the world right here in Australia, and standing up for equality, is pretty fucking remarkable that humanity continues to show us that we are resilient, that when we come together as a team, we can kind of do anything. It's like everybody in this room right now is coming to events like this to keep them moving forward and enable it to continue for years to come to elevate Brisbane. So I just wanted to stop and reflect and think about the inputs of my life to better understand the outputs and how everything that's happened to me has in some form or another enabled who I am today. And I want to start with my dad. My dad is an amazing person. And since day one, he always said to me, believe in yourself. Every single day, he said, believe in yourself. Not in a cheesy way, in an authentic way around Really remembering to believe in yourself. And that simple gift to tell your loved ones, tell your friends to believe in themselves goes so far and has had an impact on me to this day where I still talk to my children about believing in themselves. He said there's no such word as can't. And of course there is. I used to say stupid things like, you can't fly to the moon. And he'd try and get me to work around that and think about it. But that thought that there's no such word as can't just gets you to think differently. And then... There's my mum, and I told my mum she was going to be in this, and she was like, don't put me in it. And she always taught me to use my imagination. She used to say, go outside and play. Explore the world around you. And that is a gift in how I look at the world right now. I know I do. I look at the small things, and I get a lot of pleasure from it. However, as amazing as my parents were individually, as a collective, they were completely toxic. We had a really, really tense time at home, and the household was full of tension. Really, really hard at times, and there's volatility always. You never knew what was going to happen next. Quite uncomfortable. Of course, there was brilliance around that, but it was hard. But what I realized is that the tension enabled empathy, trying to understand, when's my dad going to get stressed next? When's my mum going to get stressed? And that empathy is so important. So start to understand how you can embrace that empathy. And the volatility enabled me to think more about imagination. So when times got really hard, I used to go outside. I used to go and 
use my imagination as escapism. So again, thinking about how you turn those negatives into a positive. And, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. That's all good. How, some, next time, you're on the wrong slide, Ben. Um, so you didn't get to see the words, but you saw a sneak preview. So when the next part for me that was pretty tricky, and I don't really talk to many people about this, I really haven't, to be honest, is around school and experiencing bullying. I went, you know, not my entire school life, but I went for a pretty um, hardcore state of bullying during the same time that my parents got divorced. It was quite intense. And during that time, I'm just going to double check, you'll see what I'm seeing now. Yeah, we're all back. <laughs> all good. Um, I felt really lonely. When I was being bullied, I didn't have anybody to talk to. I just, my parents were splitting up. I spent a lot of time on my own. And I was also starting to become really pessimistic, which is not who I am. It's not what I was. And I realized that the loneliness enabled me to become more adaptable because I wanted to prove that I could make new friends. I could be good. I could be, have self-worth. And the pessimism made me go, fuck this shit. I'm going to be optimistic. I don't want to be, and I'm not going to let this get me down, and I'm going to move forward. And that's really, really important that you turn those negatives into positives. The next one is fast-forwarding to university and finding my first mentor, Ben Beach, who's co-founder of I Love Dust in the UK. He wasn't at the time, but he had a profound impact on me because he was so incredible. And I suddenly put myself next to him and went, fuck, he's good, and I'm shit. And I really started to go, well, now I need to change gears and think differently. And as I mentioned, at the time, I felt average, and I was a little bit unmotivated. But I realized that I needed to transition to thinking about excellence and bring that passion back in. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you're in control of turning negatives into positives. No matter where you are, what you're doing, what life's throwing at you, where you're at, how do you channel that and shift gears and change it? So now I'm going to fast forward and jump into Australia. Ten years into my career, I'm from the UK, from London, I moved to Australia. Massive shift for me. And I met Mike Rigby. And some of you may have been here when Mike talked. That's massive. He's big in real life, and now he's gigantic. <laughs> um, the, um, whoever's met him, he has that energy. He has that passion. He's ev evangelical in his cause. You can't help but be inspired by him. I feel really lucky that he's a friend and a mentor. During that time, I reached out to him last week and said, hey, Mike, can you just give me a quote about resilience? Because it's probably going to be better than mine. And um, he said to me, creativity, to me, is the will and resilience to bring imagination into reality. And I love this. Because if you unpack what he's talking about there, when he's talking about reality, ideas are easy. It's easy to think creatively. But it needs resilience and tenacity and belief and passion and courage to take things to reality. So any idea you've got in your head, how do you get that out and take it to market, back yourself? During that time with Mike, in the first four years of joining Interbrand, we worked on some incredible projects. Sky New Zealand rebranded Telstra from a telco to a techco. We worked with Quagoma, Darling Harbour. We did some amazing projects that really transformed how I started to think about design how it was about communication, not decoration, solving problems, creating impact. But like all good things, they come to an end. And after four years, Mike decided to leave. And pretty much most of the entire studio decided it was time to leave too. And we're talking about resilience here. And it's the resilience to go, OK, well, every single week, somebody else is leaving because Mike left. It was pretty hectic. Some people in this room who also worked at Interbrand at the same time as me remember that. And we got all the way down to about eight people from 50. I remember thinking, shit, maybe I should go too. But on the flip side, I thought, actually, you know what? Someone's got to stay. Someone needs to sort of keep wanting to decorporatize Australia. Someone's got to keep wanting to do stand-up artwork so we continue to build that legacy. And I think we went even harder, you know, talking about moving forward, not bouncing back, moving forward. We worked on Sydney Opera House, the Australian Design Center, Factory, IGA, Fed Square more recently, creating some incredible big impact, big businesses from small to medium to gigantic. 
and putting that passion and that energy into creating stand-apart work and taking people with us. It's never about the individual. It's about a collective of people who give a shit and building that business back up. And on that slide, you saw it went from 50 down to 8 to 20, back up to 20 people, back up to 30. We don't need to be 50 people, because then you have to start doing shit work. So you keep it smaller, you get to do great work. But there's one project that I wanted to focus on, because this, for me, is the articulation of resilience, not just from us, but from all of Australia. So when everyone is saying no, say yes, especially if you believe in it. And we know that the toxic marriage equality debate, then the overfunded no campaign, needed the whole of Australia to come together. And I remember going to a march where Kieran Brady, who is the head of marriage equality, well, I don't know if he was the head, but he was part of marriage equality, and he did a really incredible speech. And I remember something that really stuck out to me. I just had my second son, he was really young, and he said, we're doing this the right thing to do, not just for the people that are here at this march, not just for the people that are alive right now, but for the people that aren't even born yet. Because why should they be born into a world where you have to, everybody's telling you no? And that really stuck with me. And as a team, we came together, zero budget, already up to our eyeballs in work. But his last thing that he said is, we need every man, woman, dog to come together to play a little part. So I am not pretending we played a big part here, we played a little part. But the culmination of everybody playing a little part made a difference. We went to the street with that idea of, instead of good day, mate, gay mate, Australia, are we missing something? In this situation, we had people shouting at us. It actually was quite scary at times, like strange people in your face saying, no, no, no. I actually found it really, really, com it was really intense that time working on this project. But we developed a very simple idea that cut through for the apathetic middle to ask them, Australia, are we missing something? We built a t-shirt, we designed a t-shirt, we sent it out to lots of people because we wanted them to go home and wear it and talk to their parents, start to have that debate, change the conversation. And we really had to beg, borrow and steal, speak to lots of people to try to get them on side to be a part of this campaign. We spoke to Tim Jones, an amazing photographer that wanted to be a part of this, wanted to help us, because they believed, and it's that passion that helped bring people on that journey. We created a campaign. It wasn't really a campaign. It was fly posters across all the major cities in Australia. We had no money. We reached out to clients who wanted to help put a little bit of money into this. Didn't necessarily want to put their name to it, but they gave us money, because it's provocative. But if you don't stand for something, you don't stand for anything at all. One of the amazing parts of this for me was going to a rally and seeing people wearing the t-shirts and wearing it with pride and telling us about their individual stories, about why this mattered to them and about changing the conversation. And of course, the most powerful part was when Australia said yes. And that was an amazing moment. Yeah, a big round of applause for everyone. Like, you know, it's amazing. And like I said, we played a small part in this, but that collective energy of resilience, of courage, of bravery pushed Australia forward. So in my time at Interbrand, what did I learn? I learned that change is a constant. I learned that you can't make up culture. You cannot make up culture. It has to be something born out of doing brilliant work. So when we went down to our lowest point, it was about, well, let's get back to doing great work. Egos get in the way of everything. Everybody has a little bit of an ego, but try to focus on output over ego. So when you're in a room with someone, try to get to the a collective solution. Negativity is contagious, but so is positivity. You know, of course, Matt introduced me about optimistic realism. So be optimistic. You don't have to be negative, but you can be real. You can think about, well, how do I get through this with a real perspective? And last but not least, I realized that it's really hard to find talent. So always invest in the next generation. And there's a whole mixture of ages in here and there's a lot of the next generation in here to go even harder and make up for all the mistakes of previous generations. So now I'm going to shift gears now and jump into RGA and take all of those learnings into moving to a new company in a pandemic. I got a call from Mike Rigby again. Yes, he's my hero. Um, I'm a fanboy. Um, 
he called me up and said, hey, Ben, why don't you join us? Um, build a new practice across APAC, brand design and consulting. I was like, mate, we're in a pandemic. He was like, oh, don't worry about it. Let's do it. You're going to be great. Um, and obviously, I knew that there was two choices. Go even harder at Interbrand because everybody, the whole world is facing change. Or put that energy into something new. And I chose the latter. And of course, like most things in my life, I messaged my mum. And I said, mum, she said, why would you leave a job in a pandemic? Are you mad? Love mum. <laughs> and I said to her simply, because I want to work at one of the coolest companies in the world. Love, Ben. And I'm a fanboy of a million things, but always been a massive fan of Nike. Since being nine years old, being bullied, and my escapism was also basketball. That was a massive passion of mine. And Nike has been one of RGA's biggest clients for 22 years. They've incrementally continued to help elevate their greatness. So I was inspired to be a part of that. Of course, I want to work on big global projects like Nike. You know, seeing that combination of design and technology, that maker mindset coming to life was fascinating. This is um, an AR experience of Michael Jordan's celebrating his famous free throw dunk. This was a trainer drop that sold out in 23 minutes because of that total immersion, because of that intersection of technology and creativity. It's looking at Nike and seeing how we humanize technology, really thinking about that experience strategy and how it comes to life in beautiful crafted design that's human first, really taking something incredibly complicated and serving it up in a way that is absolutely delightful and beautiful. And the more we understand that data, it's a value exchange. Understanding the data means that Nike can constantly innovate and create more innovation that's relevant for its customer. And like I said, it's like the detail that fascinated me. It's that engineer mindset, that technology, the craft, all those different things coming together and how it all comes together for a reason, because of the intersectionality of RGA. And this is one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to join RGA, because I love brand, but it's so much more than brand. It's experience, it's technology, it's marketing, and it's innovation, all being wrapped up together to move things forward. If you just create a nice brand, cool, but has it created impact? Has it in inspired or changed someone's trajectory? So really thinking of that intersectionality, bringing the right minds together to create change. And that's not new news. It's something that's been fundamentally part of the RGA philosophy for 40 years, because Bob Greenberg was a massive fan of the Bauhaus. And the Bauhaus was so ahead of its time. It was all about bringing diversity to the table, gender equality. It was all about like minds, different disciplines, solving problems the way the world should be. And that's still fundamental to the core belief of RGA now, and something that still inspired me to want to join, is that they talk about, RGA talks about itself as the Silicon, sorry, at the Bauhaus of Silicon Valley. And it's pretty amazing, because they really practice what they preach. And you can see on these slides how even the buildings of Bauhaus have informed the approach to RGA buildings, and how we're now moving to a work from anywhere mentality. But this is probably one of the most exciting parts for me, is the purpose. And it's, you need to know why you're joining a business. And RGA's purpose is really powerful. It's that we design business and brands for a more human future. The design part of that is really important because the design is about solving problems. And the human futures bit is about technologies moving faster than ever. So how do we make sure we put humans first? How do we design for humanity? And it's our job as creatives, as agencies, to try to help technology companies and all companies put humanity first. So now I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit about my experience of building a new practice in a pandemic at RGA. Really, really fucking hard, to be honest. And that's the point that I wanted to share with you, that, again, all the inputs from my journey have helped me move forward, have helped me be resilient, have helped me think of different ways in. And it's been amazing. Um, you know, talk about the intersectionality. Well, we're going to turn that into 3D. We're going to go even harder. 
I definitely get a bit carried away, but that's kind of exciting. It's that optimism to push things forward. So what do we have to do? Develop a new practice. So first and foremost, in a pandemic, develop a new practice. No one's ever heard of brand design and consulting, so it's a net new business. Build relationships. It's so important that you reach out to all the people you know. Start talking to people, telling people about this. We also, in this time, not just me, but a wider collective of people, wanted to reboot RGA Sydney, because it had been through a lot of change, and it was really important to set straight where we were heading and what we were going to do and help Sydney find its greatness. We wanted to generate new business. Obviously, everybody shut their doors. No one wanted to talk. Literally, two months into the job and I hadn't met a single person. Really, really scary, but the most exciting thing in my entire career. And a big part of that was creating radical collaboration. So how do we make sure that we're collaborating across all the different disciplines? not operating in silos, because then we're actually not doing anything different, making sure we're bringing all those people together to create change. So like I said, developing a new practice is really, really fucking hard and daunting. But you have to create bold ambitions, lofty aspirations. Where are we taking this? Where are we heading? And really simply, which I'm sure a million of you have done, is quite quickly thinking about a 30, 60, 90-day plan and beyond. Like, I'm a creative at heart, right? And all of a sudden, I'm thrusted into this new position to build a new practice in a pandemic. So I had to switch gears pretty quickly from that optimism to that realism, to getting much more practical with how I think about things. And this is not something I'd normally do, but all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, this makes sense. Let's do this. So what do we want to achieve in 30 days? What do we want to achieve in 60 days? What do we want to achieve in 90 days? And how do we keep moving forward? Because even in those 30, 60, 90 days, there were some really low points. But you learn from those, and you keep pushing yourself forward. As long as you're learning, it doesn't really matter. And you've got the backing and the belief of the entire network. And the network's really important, because that's all about building relationships. And relationships are so important. Like today, after this talk, go talk to everyone. Because those relationships might be your next job, might be your next project. It's really important to discuss and talk and network. RGA has a massive network, 1,600 people globally. But one RGA, we work on a one RGA model where everybody's absolutely connected. It's in our KBIs to talk to each other, to elevate each other's thinking. And in the first month, I think I spoke to about 100 people. It was exhausting, Zoom fatigue maximum. But it felt like I was plugging into the matrix. I was like, fuck, this is wild. I've just had 100 educations in a month. And it's really beautiful to listen to people, to learn from people, because they've got so much to give. And if you want to give, there's takers in this world, but be a giver, or somewhere in the middle. You know, keep track of what you're giving. And so you're making sure you're getting it back. But speaking to Bob Greenberg was incredible. I felt very, very privileged to have a half an hour Zoom with him. And talk about somebody that understands resilience, because he has a company that's been going for 40 years and changes every seven years. Change is a feature, not a bug, as he would say. And the beauty with this conversation is we talked about all sorts of stuff. My dog, you can kind of see my dog, and he got really happy. And it was kind of like, oh, wow, he likes my dog. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you can have him. Oh, shit, I can't. Um, and it was amazing, because he said to me, hey, Ben. This is your opportunity. Go for it. Believe in yourself. And I was like, oh, fuck. That's what my dad said. Believe in myself. And it was a really powerful moment. Um, but moving on, um, hiring the right people is the most important and the hardest part of setting up a new business. You've got to bring the best people. Because you bring someone who's average, they'll bring someone who's even more average. You've got to find those people who are excellent who are multidisciplined, who can have a superpower, but know how to adapt that intersectionality again. So on that pre sorry, let me just go back a slide. So on that slide is Henry, myself, Sam and Jane, and Kat, some of the most talented people I've ever worked with, because they give a shit. Because against all odds this year, they've just gone harder and harder. And they really believe in where we're heading because we've set lofty ambitions. We know that 60, 90 is there to follow, and everyone's on the same page. And that energy is contagious across the entire region. 
And that's beauty in diversity across our region. Diversity is so important in all walks of life. And this is across APAC, but we get to work on a daily basis in the physical in Australia and on the digital across a virtual team. You only have to look at that to see the beauty in that, that that's the future, especially as we no longer have any more boundaries. Geographic boundaries are a thing of the past. So we can bring the best people together to create change. And that brings these beautiful perspectives. It's so important when you're hiring and you're thinking about people to bring to your team, how you bring that diversity into the team. Next is about rebooting Sydney. What do we need to do? Well, we're really fortunate, again, we have an incredible leadership team who are all connected by the desire to create positive change, to make RGA brilliant, but more importantly, lift Sydney, push it even further, and we're already achieving that. It's incredible to see how people are doing the best work of their career. And a big part of that is inspiring people, little tiny things showing that you care, the value of people, building hype packs, you know, changing the conversation and getting people to go, okay, this is a company that cares about me and it's cool. And I actually might wear it. It's not shit, it's pretty cool. And it was really nice when we handed this all out to the entire agency across Australia to see everyone in the next morning in the Zoom. We, we, we timed it all so everyone kind of got them at the same time and everybody wore it and was like, yeah, fucking right. It's our uniform. Really cool. And it's beautiful to start to see everybody start to come together and interact. In this picture, it's just a small snapshot of of a few people, but pretty much every single person in that picture has a different discipline. And all of a sudden, we're getting back to those Bauhaus principles of intersectionality, of disciplines. And the next part, which is the hardest part, and anyone in here who's got their own business knows it, is new business, is getting that new business, inspiring people to want to invest in you, especially if they've never even heard of you. They've heard of RGA, but they're not necessarily thinking about RGA for brand. We spoke to millions of people, and so many people were just busy trying to sort their own lives out, trying to keep their own businesses moving forward. But every so often, somebody's interested. And even when they're not, and you feel demoralized, you've got to learn from that. Go, what did I not do? What's not connecting here? When I'm trying to speak to people, when I'm trying to engage interest, how do I shift and change and constantly iterating to learn how to move forward? And that's really, really important. And I feel really inspired because I think one of the most important things is the work. Work inspires people. It builds culture. It builds connections. It builds scar tissue because you're all in it together, working really fucking hard and pushing the limits to create incredible creativity. And this is just a snapshot of some of the work we've done in the last 12 months, literally 12 months, hence why I'm looking tired. Not just me. <laughs> Loads of us doing this, working on amazing projects, building our relationship in Australia with Nike, working on a brand that sends stuff to the moon, humanizing AI. The list goes on, but doing projects we care about and we give a shit about. But as I mentioned, one of the most important things is that radical collaboration. I'm just going to go a little bit deeper on a project just to sort of show you how we think and how we move at speed to create, to make. And it starts with a legacy business out of Singapore. So we, we operate across APAC. And this is a brand called Comfort Delgro. They're one of the largest mobility companies in the world. But they are an old business. And there's lots of new economy brands on the horizon. So they needed to signify change. They need to build new products that utilize their unique assets, so what makes them unique, and rethink those into a modern way to engage and inspire a next generation of people. It was really fucking stressful, again. It was the first pitch I worked on, a lot of pressure on the team. Oh, Ben, right, cool, what are you gonna do? I don't fucking know, but we're gonna try. And it was worth millions of dollars, massive team. And this picture is true, it's kind of how I felt inside, but I reached out, I tried to go out to my network, speak to the people that were gonna help me shift perspective, make me laugh, give me the inspiration to move forward, all those different mentors, the importance of mentors. And we had an amazing team, again. 
Be innovative, super creative, and ambitious. This is, again, a very, very multidisciplined team, and it got much bigger than this. But in the pitch, we had to pitch. We put everything in it. We were up against the big corporate consultancies, your big ones. I'm not going to call them out, but the big. Say they do creativity, but do they? And that was a superpower for us, because we can do the nitty-gritty, the business strategy, the you know, all that intense innovation strategy, but we can also do creativity. We can embrace the ambiguity of what that means. And that's what helped us win the pitch. And I remember <laughs> I was stressed, really stressed, sweating, like that picture. And this happened, and I got a call, phone call from Jahan that was the, our innovation strategist. And he said, Ben, we won. And that is literally how I felt. I'm not fucking joking. I think I did that in Kmart. <laughs> because I was like, we've done it. We've won something, and it's just such an amazing feeling. Because what you put in, you get out, right? And what did we have to do? This is when the real hard work started. We had to do a net new digital venture built in six months. Six months to make this happen. We knew we were only going to be able to do it if we brought the team together. Worked as one tight team, bonded by the pressures that were inevitably going to come our way. And we worked across 15 cities and six time zones. But it was all run out of APAC. So in a nutshell, this app is about powering discovery, connection, and mobility through connected lifestyle service. So really cool, taking the unique assets of Comfort Delgro, a mobility company that operates on trains, taxis, and buses, but then wants to go deeper than that and introduce lifestyle, an application that enables you to move, but helps you discover, brings people together through shared experiences, movies, film, food, and destinations. And it's a lifestyle app that's really starting to change the game called Zig. And I'll start to break down what we did. So as I mentioned, it's about the app itself is about discovery, togetherness, and mobility. We built a whole world around this. Zig is a loaded name, packed full of behaviors. But in a nutshell, what we were trying to do is move people, literally move people, but also metaphorically move people, because this was all built in COVID, a team that hadn't met each other physically. So we also knew this is a way to get Singapore moving again, by giving them the things they love, by being the antithesis of monotony. I'm gonna play a quick video that breaks this down. So you could see the seamlessness of brand, experience, technology, and innovation all coming together and working in harmony. And that's the beauty of collaboration, is output over ego. Really, really important. We started with a compelling active purpose, driving access to life, driving, we're driving access to life. We're a mobility company, and we're connecting people to life. We looked at the current behaviors, but more importantly, the future behaviors, so that we can make sure that we understood exactly who and what we were designing for to enable us to build the relevant features. What do people want in their lives? There's a whole million things we could provide, but it's actually being really focused 
on how we want to connect and how we're going to inspire people and keep them in that ecosystem. As I mentioned, we built a behavior. We looked at the word Zig. We named it Zig after my dog. True story. Um, and Zig means to go directly somewhere, and Zag is to discover. So there's those two behaviors. Get me to A to B. Help me discover the things I love. And that was really simple in how we broke it down. We had Zig as a word mark, as a name, sorry, loaded verb. We create a symbol that has the Z in it, which is also the map through the city. In the actual word mark, Zig has that dynamism connected to it. And the behavior literally built into the app itself is move, press move to Zig, and Zag to discover. And then the way that gets connected all the way through to create that connected brand experience. And what's really important, like we talked about with the Nike work, is that technology is complicated. So how do we make sure we humanize it through language, through tone of voice, through imagery, through illustration, through animation that warms up this entire experience, that it seemingly connects from product to communication to internal? And how that design system, working with the UI and UX team to make sure that the brand absolutely comes to life through that user experience, I've worked on a million projects in the past where you create an amazing idea, and then you hand it over to an external agency, and they completely fuck it up. And all of a sudden, it's really nice to have a team where everybody's got each other's best interests, which is to create brilliant work, crafted design, built out of strong problems that we're trying to solve. We developed our characters because at the time, you couldn't film anything. You couldn't get out and about and meet people. So we created a characters to represent the diversity of Singapore. But they also play a role to pop up and inspire you. You can follow them on Instagram. We called them our Zig Zigfluencers. So that you can be inspired by what they do. Where do they eat? Where do they play? Who do they hang out with? Because I want to go there too, because we're mobility, discovery, and togetherness. We bought lots of assets. We had a lot of fun. Once we knew, you know when you've got a great idea, because it just keeps giving. And we brought it to life across a million different things. It needs to be functional, expressive and really delightful for people to interact and play with. We created a comprehensive design system using Figma. Figma's a tool we use. I'm sure many people in this room use it too. And it's such a simple way of designing. It speeds up everything. And it's, again, a beautiful way to connect all the disciplines, to prototype, to design, to build. And the tech stack that sits behind this is behemoth. It's massive. But we tried to simplify it with our technologists on how to bring that together how to simply build a tech step. If you think about legacy businesses, often their technology is really hard to change. It's like speaking to a plumber. Hey, how much is this going to cost to change this pipe? It's going to take you six months to do that. And it's the same with legacy IT systems. So when we try to create new economy IT systems, it's about tech stacks. So you can swap things out, and you can create things. You can achieve things. We tested this. Sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Um, let me go back. It's that testing with the designer, the user, and bringing those things together and then bringing it back to the engineer so everybody singing from the same hymn sheet and working together. And then testing it in real life is really hard. This app is always moving. It's connecting people. So learning in real time, jumping in the back of cabs and listening and learning to, at times, very older senior taxi drivers who find this technology pretty complicated. So again, how do we simplify it? And what's really exciting is it became the number one app on Apple Store in two months. They said, we built this in six months. It became the number one travel app in Singapore within two months. It's, most importantly, been given an 85% positive net score to the master brand, Comfort Del Gro. So building that positive equity, which was the original brief, always starting with that brief. And it happened because of that intersectionality. All those different people coming together I've never experienced anything like it myself, and that everyone moving together for the same cause. So I nearly finished. Don't worry. You're probably exhausted. I am. Um, the outtakes. What are we going to focus on? So obviously hard work, right? Hard work. And really backing yourself. When times get hard, just going even harder. But taking time out. So what did I learn in the last 12 months? I would say, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. I think that's really important. You know, you can ask my team, James here today, I'm pretty open. When I'm finding it hard, I'll talk to them. Just because you're in a leadership position doesn't mean you can't be transparent. 
I do put on a brave face. I think that's part of the early inputs that I talked about earlier. But it's important to be vulnerable. Everything's a work in progress, literally. We have an 80-20 rule at RGA where we're never 100% finished because we leave 20% open to enable people to keep moving forward. And that's how we should be thinking as businesses, as people. We're never finished because then it's the end. So it's OK not to know everything. You know, we talk about imposter syndrome. You join something huge. You're like, fucking hell, where am I going to go here? But again, just navigating your own journey, finding that support network, believing in yourself. No such word as can't. Use your imagination. All those things that have shaped me. And everybody in this room has their different version of that and how you challenge it. And to not sit there in silence. When the going gets tough, and it will, because nothing that's good is easy, it's to find that support network, whether that's your friend, your mum, somebody on a podcast, whatever. But find those ways, whether it's humor, whether it's vision, whether it's strategic thinking, whether it's just going away for the weekend, but finding that support network. Don't do it in silence, because that's when it, you're not making progress. And my biggest support network is my family. This slide gets me a bit emotional. Um, because my son said to me, believe in yourself when I came here today. Don't mean to get upset, but it's big. So that's me today. Thank you, everyone. Awesome.